Apparently our president wanted to wish us a happy Good Friday. That was <laughs> provocative. <laughs> happy Good Friday. You know, it's like, you know, if you're not down with the culture, just, you know, maybe just lay low. Like, like in the Muslim culture, you know, they say, Assalamu alaikum, and then you're supposed to say malaikum assalam. I never say that. I'm I'm embarrassed. I just said it, cause I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm doing. I would like to be, you know, down with the other cultures, but I'm never ever saying assalam malaikum malaikum assalam. No way. You. This is the last time you'll ever hear it. I'm never saying it, but. I know something about Easter, and I'm pretty sure what you say is Happy Easter. I don't know what you say on Good Friday. Just just go to work. Keep your head down. I think that's pretty much it. That's, that's the, I, I don't know. What do you say? Does anybody know what you say on Good Friday? Sorry for your loss. Uh, better luck on Sunday. I don't know. Please tell me what you say on Good Friday. Okay, today's poll question, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Yes or no? I want to know what you guys think. Okay. Um, okay, that's the question out there. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Um, I am going to... Katie, how are you? Happy Easter. I um... am... <laughs> I'm going to talk about Easter today. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about Easter and... Um, I hope that it's not how you normally talk about Easter, okay? That's my hope. I hope you walk away from this being like, well, that was interesting. Hmm. <laughs> Satan? You know, I want, I want the church lady to come back into your skull and just think, what was that? And the reason I want to do that is because I believe that Religion, maybe not religion, maybe religion. I don't know what religion. Spirituality is meant to expand your mind. It is meant to make you think bigger, not smaller. Perhaps even religion is the opposite of that, that religion wants you to think smaller, not bigger. They want you to be um, myopic in a weird, weird way. They want you to be like our way or the highway. Okay. Um, I got a little, I got a little deal here. Okay. I, I have other things I want to know from you guys. Are you doing anything for Easter now? Are you doing anything? Um, Ashley, hi. Uh, are you uh, going to have some turkey, some turkey? course not see look everybody knows you don't have turkey on easter although i did find that the honey baked ham people want to upsell you a 24 dollar three pounds of turkey i went and splurged i split it with my in-laws the honey baked ham we're going to be having that at four o'clock i live in a duplex my in-laws live downstairs we live upstairs uh my mother-in-law is going to um, remove the turkey 45 minutes before 4 o'clock and then put in the frozen sides that I got, two sides for $22. I just don't even understand what kind of cult they're running over there at Honey Baked Ham, but I, I bought it hook, line, and sinker. I bought literally $100 worth of ham, potatoes, ham, yeah, and some rolls. A hundred dollars. No 
know what I'm spending my stimulus check on. Honey baked ham. I don't know. I just wanted it. I, I, my mother-in-law is, um, you know, she's really big into holidays and we're not obviously having a, you know, the traditional holiday. And besides, I love honey baked ham. I love it. I love it. I can't help that it's $75. Literally that ham. I don't know. Nine, 10 pounds of it. $75. I guess that's $7 a pound. I suppose that's not the worst thing ever, but still it's ridiculous. It's ham. Poor piggies aren't worth a damn thing around here. Okay. Uh, is my poll working? I don't even know. I, I don't even know. I don't know. What's going on? Video clipping. Where's my poll? I'm going to do another poll. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Yes. No. Oh, I'll add another option. Maybe so. That's why it didn't work, because I needed to add another option. Oh, dang. Oh, they're not published. Ah, now it's published. There we go. There it is. There it is. Did I, did I publish it or not? Oh, publish. Jeez, they make you freaking push a billion buttons just to... Okay, good. Yes, no, maybe so. I want to know. I want to know. Okay. Um, I want to read a little out of this little tidbit. This is from, I don't know. I don't know where this is from. This is like from live science. Okay. Ancient accounts tell of an important figure whose birth would be heralded by a star in the heavens, a god who would later judge the dead. He would be murdered in a betrayal by one of his close to him, his body hidden away, not for long, as he would return in a miraculous resurrection to be given an eternal reign in heaven. This is a nice lead-in. To his legions of followers. And his resurrection came to symbolize the promise of eternal life. The figure Osiris was the supreme god in ancient Egypt, only one of many pagan gods worshipped thousands of years before the birth of Jesus. Indeed, Jesus... Though Jesus is currently best known example of a resurrection figure, figure, he is far from the only one. Is resurrection real? Uh, let me jump down here. Um, blah, blah, blah. This was not the article that I wanted. Never mind. That, I guess that's good. So you should know that. That, um, that uh, Jesus is not the only resurrection story. Osiris is uh, a big example. Okay. Now, here. This is the one. I don't why didn't I save this one? This was the one I wanted to save. Okay. In 1998, Lee Strobel, a reporter for the Chicago Tribune and a graduate of Yale Law School, published A Case for Christ, a journalist's personal personal investigation for the evidence of Jesus. Strobel had formerly been an atheist, okay? That's his lead in. He was an atheist. Uh, like I was, and was compelled by his wife's conversation to evangelical Christianity, conversion. His wife converted to evangelical Christianity to refute the key Christian claims about Jesus. Paramount among these was the historicity. I love that word, historicity. That will be the word of the day. Use it at your uh, quarantined uh, Easter dinner. Historicity of Jesus' resurrection. But other claims include the belief in Jesus as the literal Son of God and the accuracy of the New Testament writing. Strobel, however, was unable to refute these claims to his satisfaction and then converted to Christianity as well. His book became one of the best-selling works of Christian apologetic. That is a defense to the reasonableness and accuracy of Christianity. This has got good words in it. You should read this out loud. It's nice on the tongue. Reasonableness and historicity. This Friday, April 7th, motion picture. This is not this Friday, some other year. Motion picture adaptation of The Case for Christ is being released. The movie attempts to make a compelling case for the historicity. Once again, that guy is dropping big words of Jesus' resurrection. As one character says to Strobel early in the movie, if the resurrection of Jesus didn't happen, it's, i.e., the Christian faith, is a house of cards. A house of cards, says someone. Says someone. It's a house of cards if it didn't happen. As a religious study professor specializing in New Testament early Christianity, this guy... I hold that Strobel's book and the movie adaptation have not proven the historicity. God dang it, he's used the historicity three times. 
It's word porn. Stop it. I like the fact that you know the word hysterosity, but now it's just getting, you're just whoring it out. Hysterosity. Say it again, I dare you. Of Jesus' resurrection for several reasons. Are all of Strobel's arguments relevant? It says, for instance, Strobel makes much of the fact that there are over 5,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. He does this to argue that can be quite, anyways. I would certainly agree that these early manuscripts provide us a fairly good idea of the origin uh, form of the New Testament. Yet, even if these second century copies are accurate, all we have are first century writings that claim Jesus was raised from the dead. What do they prove? One key argument in the movie comes from the New Testament writing known as 1 Corinthians, written by Apostle Paul to the group of Christians, blah, blah, blah. Paul is thought to have written this letter around the year 52, about 20 years after Jesus' death. Paul gives a list of people who, 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 uh, whom the risen Jesus appeared. You got Apostle Peter. You got James, the brother of Jesus. Who? Did Je Jesus has a brother? Anyways, never mind. Most intriguingly, a group of more than 500 people at the same time. Many scholars believe that Paul here is quoting from a much earlier, earlier Christian creed. Uh, raised from the dead. Anyways, it says, What is certain is that the earliest followers of Jesus believed that Jesus had come back to life in the body and that this was a body that had been real bodily characteristics. It could have been seen, touched, and had a voice that could be heard. This does not, however, in any way prove that Jesus was resurrected. It is not unusual for people to see loved ones who have died. In a study of nearly 20,000 people, 13% reported seeing the dead. 13% of 20,000 people. There are a range of explanations for this phenomenon, running the gamut from the physical and emotional exhaustion caused by the death of loved ones, uh, all the way to the belief that some of the aspects of human personality are capable of surviving bodily death. In other words, the sighting of the risen Jesus are not nearly as unique as Strobel would suggest. A miracle or not, by what of the five? But what of the five hundred people? What about the five hundred people? First of all, biblical scholars have no idea what event Paul is even talking about. What are you even talking about, Paul? Come on now. In remembrance of the day of Pentecost, Acts two, volume volume two one verse one. You know it. When the Holy Holy the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit gave the Christian community in Jerusalem a supernatural ability to speak in languages that were unknown to them. But one leading scholar has suggested this event was added to the list of resurrection appearances by Paul and that its origins are uncertain. All right, I don't need to read all this. Uh, okay, so basically, I don't know. Um, so then they talk about, uh, but then they're like, argues that the resurrection is best explanation for the fact that Jesus' tomb was empty on Easter morning. But his tomb was empty, for God's sake. For Jesus' sake. Some scholars would question how early the empty tomb story is. There's significant evidence that the Romans did not typically remove victims from the crosses. Maybe he's still on the cross. Therefore, it is possible that a belief in Jesus' resurrection emerged first and that the empty tomb story originated only when the early critics of Christianity doubted the veracity of this claim. I bet that word hysterosity is coming out again. I just, he's just, he just loves the big words. But even if we assume that the tomb really was empty that morning, what is there to prove that it was a miracle and not that Christ's body was removed for uncertain reasons? Maybe somebody just took it. He didn't walk away. How, you ever think of that? I mean, everything that's stolen, you're like, God, it, it, just, it was a miracle. My bicycle was here out of the front of the store. I came back and it was gone. What happened to my bicycle? It must have developed a personality and walked away. That's the only reason it could happen. Miracles I bar definition, an extremely improbable events, and I see no reason to assume that one has taken place when other explanations are far more plausible. Did they see him go in there? Did, what? We didn't see him resurrect. There is no story where he resurrects. Like, you, nobody is watching. Like, Mary isn't watching, and he's like, oh, my God, he's lying dead all jacked up, and he just stands up and walks out the tomb. Nowhere is it that. Who are the experts? Apart from all these other weaknesses of Stribble's presentation, I believe that Stribble has made no real effort to bring in a diversity of scholarly views. He just like picks people from Liberty University and Biola University, people that have to sign agreements that they believe in every supernatural thing told to them. Uh, uh, okay, no compelling evidence. Response: to, I would say that if we had asked scholars, uh, you get a much different verdict on the historicity 
every time you got a drink with that word hysterosity. This is the fifth time this man has used the word hysterosity, and I swear to you, no one has in my entire life ever used it, and this mofo's dropped it four times. Now I don't believe a word he says. Jesus rose from the dead because this moron can't stop using the word hysterosity. Go one more time. You only have 15 more paragraphs to go. Give me one more hysterosity, will you? And get out the bourbon because you're going to be drinking it. You have to drink every time this mofo says hysterosity. Christian apologists frequently say that the main reason that the secular scholars don't affirm the hysterosity, unbelievable, unbelievable, two sentences, it can only go two sentences, and he drops the word, I can literally see the word hysterosity here and here. No one uses that word except this guy, and he can't, it's like in every sentence. It's like when I use the F word, it's his F word. It's a noun, verb, adjective for this guy. Hysterosity. Hysterosity this. Can you believe the hysterosity of that? If I have to hysterosity that one more hysterosity time, I'm going to go hysterosity. This guy with the word. Sick of, stop it. No one uses that word. It's a good word once. You drop it once and then you, it's like you drop the mic. Hysterosity, mofo, bam, you walk out, never use it again. Jesus, crime me. Christian apologists frequently say that the main reason the secular scholars don't affirm the uh, hysterosity, the only word I can come up with, of the resurrection is because they have anti-supernatural bias. They're, they don't believe in supernatural. Just a strobel, quick. Uh, secular scholars simply refuse to believe in miracles. That's why they aren't doing it. Uh, anyways, I very little doubt that some of Jesus' followers believe that there had been some alive after his death, yet the world is full of extraordinary claims, and the case for Christ is provided, in my evaluation, no truly compelling evidence to prove the, wait for it, wait for it, historicity of Jesus' resurrection. He, literally, he would have made it the last word of his whole thing if he could have, but he couldn't figure out how to turn Jesus' resurrection historicity. Why not, buddy? Why don't you just use that word, the last word, bam, drop it. This guy's ruining everything. Historicity, God, man. I'm, uh, he must have had, like, some sort of... Uh, this guy is a scholar, okay? Literally, this guy, like, is smart, okay? Here he is. Brett Landau, lecturer of religious studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Well, that's not, I don't know. Don't they just smoke pot down there and eat ribs? I, I, I think there must have been, like, some sort of bet. He's like, I bet you to, uh, you can't use the word hysterosity a dozen times in a thousand word article. And he's like, watch me, watch me, hold my, hold my bong. I'm going to go drop it right now. Okay, look. One yes, good, all right. Hey, Robin, I'm proud of you too, Roz. <laughs> all right, we got one yes. Okay, um... If anything, that article should lead you to believe that, who knows if Jesus rose from the dead. That's my new word of the day. Good, Robin. You need to use it in every other paragraph. Historicity. Okay. Look. No one saw Jesus wake up in the tomb. They basically come over to the tomb, the, the stone is rolling away, and there's no Jesus. And then there's various accounts. Some people see Jesus, but they don't even recognize him, okay? One dude's walking down the path with a guy, and he's like, he doesn't even realize he's walking next to Jesus. The, you know, the the the. the the second coming, Jesus. The re resurrected Jesus. It is controversial. 
Okay. For me, I don't believe he was resurrected like, like, shoot me in the face and then I stand up and walk away. That's for me. Okay. I do not believe. I do not believe personally that that's what's happened. Okay. Now, this is the beauty of belief. There is no scientific. There's no science to it. Science is another thing. Science is a thing where you have rules of how you have to prove something, okay? Like like there are rules of how science works. It's it's like it, it it's like it's like grammar. Like there are rules to language, okay? There are um in order for us to be able to communicate with each other, we adhere to a certain number of linguistic rules. Okay? And you should know that all languages are rule-based. Creole is rule-based. What did they call that? Urban Eubonics? Was that a thing? I think they kind of, you know, like they were talking about African-American uh, culture, language. All rule-based. All rule-based. We find that people are very naturally um, inclined to have rules about language so that we can all understand each other. That's all science is. It's just a game of rules that they set up and they're like, okay, look, for science to be like um, true, it has to meet these rules. Like it has to be provable and repeatable. And that's just how science works. It doesn't make spirituality any less valid. That's based on another set of rules, okay? You can live in both a scientific world and a spiritual world together. They're just different rules, okay? They're different games that you're playing. One is Monopoly and the other is chess or something. Like, if you had to apply chess rules to Monopoly, you probably wouldn't play Monopoly anymore. You'd be like, this is stupid. If you apply science rules to spirituality, you're not going to want to play spirituality anymore because you're like, this is stupid. I can't prove if Jesus got up out of that tomb or not. I don't know. I wasn't there. And look, I watched a documentary this week about the Titanic. Apparently there were like 700 people, okay, that survived off of the Titanic, okay? I don't know, 1,500 died. Uh, hold on, hold on. I don't want to, I don't want to lie to you. How many people survived off of the Titanic? 705 individuals. There it is. Here's a summary from Business yeah. Insider. Right. The Titanic, yes. built as an unsinkable ship, yeah. hit an iceberg and sank on April 15th, 1912. Yeah. yeah. Over okay. 1,500 yeah. people okay. died in the maritime right. disaster. Got it, lady. Thank you. All right. 750, okay. 50, over 1,500 died. Okay. 700 and five, did she say, people lived on the from the Titanic. That means there were 700 people around the Titanic as it sunk. 700 people. And do you know that we, to this day, do not know for a fact whether or not the Titanic broke in half above the ocean or below the ocean? We do not know. Zach. Zach, Zach. We do not, there were 705 people around the Titanic as it sank, and we do not know if it broke above the ocean or 
below the ocean. 700 people 100 years ago cannot tell us that. It would seem like that would be a pretty big thing. The largest boat. It was the largest man-made thing ever, okay? You're in the ocean. You're watching your boat sink. It would seem to me we would know whether or not it broke above the ocean or below the ocean. We know one thing, it broke. The two parts are quarter, half a mile apart on the ocean floor, two, uh, two, hour, two hours, two miles down. It definitely broke somewhere. So, yeah, there were 500 people that saw Jesus alive. There were 700 people that saw the Titanic. And we don't know if it broke in half above the ocean or below the ocean. Do you feel me? We're never going to solve this. It seems unlikely that somebody resurrected from the dead, but then it seems also not unlikely. Have you ever seen somebody resurrected after an overdose using Narcan? I swear to God, I swear to you, it looks like they are being resurrected. In fact, some people call Narcan the Lazarus drug, that it raises people from the dead. If I did not know that Narcan is this some unbelievable drug that just goes into your body and brain and somehow cuts off the opiate receptor. I don't even know what it does. All I know is I have seen it firsthand. I have seen a man limp as a noodle being pulled out of a tent. They Narcan him. And in minutes, he is up and around. And within 15 minutes, he's like leaving. And the... the the ambulance people are like, hey, you got to watch this guy. He could relapse. I couldn't even, he was so alive that I couldn't keep him sitting in a chair. He just left within 15 minutes. Okay? So, yeah. When you ask anybody that has seen people or experienced opiate overdoses, they have died. They are dead. They People that have done this and experienced this will say, I died three times. Okay? So, yeah. Do resurrections happen? Yeah, they do. Is it possible? How about this? How about they got him off the cross too early? They throw him in this cave. And he's like, wow, man, that was messed up. But he's not dead. Because one guy, Doubting Thomas, do you know the Doubting Thomas story? The Doubting Thomas, Jesus is like, stick your finger in my wound on my side. I'll show you. And you're like, damn, you really are Jesus. <laughs> yeah, damn straight up, Jesus. That was a hell of a day, but I'm all right. Everything's fine. That could have happened. All I know is I have seen people resurrected with Narcan. I've seen it. I watched uh, a show on the History Channel called The Vikings. Just Vikings, not The Vi Vikings. And there is a crucifixion scene where this one guy gets crucified, but they pull him off of the, they go save him. They pull him off of the cross. He goes on for all the rest of the seasons. He's fine. He's fine. I don't know what happened, but here's the thing. For me, the truth of it, what really happened, does not is not important to me. In fact, that's not the point at all. <laughs> the point is he is risen. Not like 
Ooh, look at the magic trick. No, 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 no. That's not the point. The point is he is risen. And what it means to us as a culture. Uh, there is a video I want you to watch. Hold on, hold on. Please. Be okay, let me put on my headphones. Uh, there is a Franciscan friar that I love, still alive, thank God. I don't know why, thank God, I don't know. Because it's cool that he's still alive. It's nice, because I love him. His name is Richard Rohr. And uh, this is his sermon that he gave uh, Easter, I think, April 3rd, 2016. Okay. Be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I was able to speak from this pulpit four years ago. I'm very honored to be invited back. I hope my thoughts aren't too confusing. I've talked uh, two times in a row now, and this is the third. And you always say, did I say that already? Or did, is that going to bore them to death? But pray that I can help open this wonderful scripture for you. It's one of those scriptures that uh, speaks for itself, stands on its own because it's so filled with magnificent metaphor and image, and yet it uh, needs to be... So Right there, he talks about metaphor and metaphor and image. Is that what he said? Now, I believe, and I'm not sure, but he talks a lot about resurrection. And I think this guy does believe that Jesus was resurrected. Okay? To be endlessly unpackaged because it is so rich. So let me try. But let me try with a begin to begin with the very last verse. It says these thoughts have been recorded to help you believe that Jesus is the Christ. Let's start with that. For those of you at the Rector's Forum, this is, of course, what I just talked about, that, that most of us were conflated the two words Jesus and Christ. Most of us, frankly, were trained to think that Christ was Jesus' last name. All right. the, <laughs> this particular passage, as many of the sermons in Acts say it much better, Jesus revealed the Christ, Jesus became the Christ, Jesus proclaimed the Christ, so let's get that straight to begin with. In John's Gospel, which is mostly talking about the Christ, we're talking about a different archetype, image, teacher than Jesus, even though they become the same. And these, this early preaching is coming to that recognition. The so what I love about this guy is he is always pushing us to think deeper about our spirituality and he's talking here uh, about you know Jesus and Christ and how those things connect the Christ and this is clear so you don't think I'm preaching something untrue this is clear here in the prologue to John's gospel the hymn at the beginning of Colossians the hymn at the beginning of Ephesians the first paragraph of Hebrews, the first paragraph of 1 John. I have to cover all my bases. So you don't think I'm making something up, all right? They all say with absolute clarity, the Christ existed from all eternity. Christ existed for all eternity. Jesus has only existed in time, 2,000 years ago. Now we who came along 2,000 years later, we just lumped the two together, Jesus Christ. Actually... It's one of the major, major Achilles heels in Christian theology because, to put it most concisely, most of us were taught or invited to fall in love with Jesus, but we weren't taught or invited to fall in love with the Christ. The Christ is a cosmic concept, and let me put it straightforwardly. The Christ is the Christian code word for reality, for everything. Jesus becomes the Christ, and in that includes in his journey that he walks 
for us and with us and in us the classic archetypal human journey from, from conception, hidden conception in Bethlehem to an ordinary life of 30 years like most of our lives are where you hardly hear about him to trial, betrayal, death, and resurrection. But this is a statement. Now listen closely. This is not just a one-time anomaly and we Christians get all happy on Easter. Yay! God, the Father raised up Jesus. No, it's a statement about how reality works all the time, everywhere. And we're living in a most... All the time, everywhere. How reality works all the time, everywhere. It's wonderful time where physics and, and uh, astrophysics especially is proving this for us. Quite simply put, nothing dies. <laughs> Everything is transformed and the final chapter of history is resurrection. Now, this was always understood by the great Christian mystics who were much more Trinitarian than most of us are. But we, we pulled Jesus out of the Trinity, tried to understand him as a standalone figure, whittled Jesus down, and unfortunately, that's why, to be perfectly blunt, we still have Christians who can be racists. We still have Christians who don't love the big mystery. They don't love the big truth. They don't love what Jesus calls the reign of God. We made Christianity into a tribal religion when it was meant to be a universal cosmic statement about how reality works. Right? Jesus is, to use maybe later language, is the, the archetype, the corporate personality, the stand-in for everything. Huh? Suddenly, it, the Christian message has huge relevance for the life, but even more relevance for history. The other great flaw, it seems to me, that we've fallen into is to pull the gospel into an individual theory of how you can go to heaven and you can go to heaven and you can go to heaven or hell or you can go to heaven or hell. What a sad story. And then, and then it all, and most people go to hell by our own rules, it seems. <laughs> and, and you listen, you know, ever since the late great planet Earth and all this malarkey about Armageddon and, and Apocalypse Now, the final end of history was not resurrection. Quite the contrary. It was all sliding down to a tragic, tumultuous, and punitive ending. You see, when all of history isn't hopeful, when society isn't hopeful, and any of you who are therapists know this, it's very hard to heal individuals. It's very hard to make you hopeful, you hopeful, you hopeful when the whole thing is going to hell in the handbasket. Do you see? <laughs> Christianity was meant to be a cosmic message of hope for history. Now, with that, let's, let's go back to the gospel text, and we're going to see what this final chapter of history... A cosmic message of hope. That's what it is, not condemnation of like, you are you either are in or out. It's hope. It's massive hope. It looks like what kind of God we really have. And of course, if we're created in the image of God, how we image God is rather important. If he's punitive, we can be punitive. If he's violent, we can be violent. But what we're going to have here appearing behind locked doors, by where they are hiding for fear of the Jews. Here we have an image of all of history hiding almost always out of fear. Look at our contemporary politics in this country, most of it fear-based, because huh? that's what appeals to the ego at it, the lowest level of motivation. In the evening of the first day of the week, the beginnings of a new creation, the first day of the week, the doors were locked. They were hiding for fear of the temple authorities. And Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Shalom. The great... Sabbath, the great peace of the Sabbath. And then he showed them the price of this transformative journey. He showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. So we have Jesus, and let me just give two succinct words to how God, Jesus, is being presented to us. This is really important. He is coming in the midst of history 
as the forgiving victim. The forgiving victim. I want to come back to that. I'm going to write that down. Forgiving victim. Let me repeat it. The forgiving victim. Without it, we all play games of victimhood for our own aggrandizement. And there will be no, no new history. There will be no new day. And, and you see this in our world right now. People simply uh, accumulating past grievances to give themselves moral high ground and the right to be violent because you did this to us. And here Jesus, who is betrayed by his own inner circle, abandoned by most of them except the three women at the foot of the cross and, and John, Betrayed and abandoned. I said to the last group, if I had reappeared, I would have said, you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> How can you be so obtuse, you know? And all he says is, shalom. Doesn't even mention it. Doesn't even bring it up. Huh? This is a new day. This is a new history, which unfortunately has not been the majority of Christian history either. And not only does this new presence, this new availability of God crossing through locked doors even, but he breathes on them. Now, any of you who are students of Scripture know what this is connoting. Where did this last happen? Right at the beginning of the Bible, in the second chapter of Genesis, where Yahweh takes the mud of the earth and he breathes into it. So we clearly have a connotation of the new Adam. If Adam was the archetype of the first human being, as Paul says in several places, Christ is the corporate personality for the second transformed human being. And here we have a marvelous symbolic metaphorical statement of what transformation looks like. Because breath and spirit, Holy Spirit and forgiveness are all equivalent. They're all the same thing. God is as available as the breath right in front of your mouth. God is always recreating humanity by this infusion of spirit, this infusion of love into the cold heart of Adam. And then to take it even further, and we call this the principle of incarnation. He knows that we're t going to do exactly what we did, largely spiritualize this whole message. And he has to bring it down to earth. He has to bring it to embodiment. He has to bring it to physicality. He has to bring it to this world and the suffering that most of us go through in this world. And he, Thomas doesn't want to believe in a wounded God. He doesn't want to believe in a God who participates and is in solidarity with human suffering. And he says, you can't know what I'm talking about, Thomas, until you put your fingers inside my wounds. You've got to feel what it feels like for the poor, for the rejected, for the abandoned. Now you can believe. This is incarnational Christianity. This is not some bypassing of the human journey. But we have Jesus returning to some form of physicality, not fleeing into the heavens, but re-entering this world. It's not some bypassing of the human journey. But we have Jesus returning to some form of physicality, not fleeing into the heavens, but re-entering this world in a new way. And brothers and sisters, that's exactly the Jesus, exactly the Jesus you have access to today. In fact, this moment. It's the same Christ. It's the same presence. It's the same forgiving victim. It's the same shalom. And it's the breath you're taking in right now. All right. So, I intentionally wanted to show that to you because I think it's important and relevant to the work that I do. And, um, so
the words that really resonate for me are forgiving victim. That he was betrayed and abandoned. So we don't, I don't think, when I think of Jesus, I don't think of a, a forgiving victim, you know, but I do think of the betrayal, the betrayal, significantly of the betrayal, right? And why would you do that to this man who is just trying to help us all? And of course he becomes the forgiving victim. He doesn't, he's not bitter. You don't see any bitterness. And then he talks about Thomas, doubting Thomas, who doesn't want to believe in a wounded God. That's the revolution of Christianity. A wounded God. That changes everything. But he tells Thomas to put his fingers into the wound. So he can feel what it's like for the poor and the suffering and the forgotten. It's important that Jesus comes back in a physical way. To be manifest God as human. It's important. I see so far three people are, yes, Jesus did rise from the dead. For me, in the, in the poll, for me... I don't care. I do not care how or if Jesus woke up and walked out of that tomb. It does not matter to me. What matters to me is the message. That God is a forgiving victim. And I am telling you now, the reason I am so committed to homeless people is because they are the forgiving victim all day long. Every day, all day. They are forgotten. They are poor. They are chastised. They are ridiculed. Exactly like Jesus. They're... You couldn't make a metaphor more perfectly if you tried. And they are walking among us. They are living among us. And they are the forgiving victim. Do you know how many times I've sinned against a homeless person? Just this week. Just this week, let me tell you what I did. George Ann texted me, who's an incredible helper, and said, hey, the people down at Adam Street need more propane. And I looked at my calendar, and I said, because they're cold, and I said to myself, toughen up, buttercup. It's April. I didn't say that to the homeless people. I didn't say that to George Ann, but that's the truth of what I said. And I wrote back to George Ann and said, I'm not giving out propane anymore this season. It's over. And she just wrote back and said, I'll, I'll let them know. And then you know what I did? Before bed, I'm the guy that takes out the dogs. 
About 8.30, I take the dogs out. One last pee. And you know what? I was cold. It was cold. And then I woke up the next morning and the ground was covered with snow. There was a, not a significant snowstorm, but it snowed and it stuck on the ground. And it was freezing. And I said, because of the calendar and because I'm lazy, because, you know, I got to go get the propane tanks. I got to collect them. And then I got to go over to the propane guy and I got to stand there while he fills them up. And he's kind of grumpy because it's cold out there. And he's not really, he's a nice guy, but, you know, and then I got to pay. I'm lazy. And so I did not bring them propane because of the calendar. They're never going to be upset about that. They're not upset. I came the next day to bring some food. And I was talking to one guy at the camp, and I said, hey, how are, how are you? Were you cold last night? He's like, no, I was fine. I was fine. He didn't complain. He didn't say, hey, Sage, would have been nice if you could have helped me out last night. Some propane. Could have brought me a little bit of propane. No. It was fine. No, we were fine. <laughs> Homeless people forgive me time and time again. It's one of the greatest things I've learned working with homeless people is their incredible forgiveness. Where I come from, in my social circles that are not when I'm not working when I'm not with homeless people, forgiveness doesn't exist. <laughs> people are pissed left and right, and they will hold on to that anger and resentment potentially for years. I do it. I'm resentful and angry and spiteful. I, in my petty little first world problems, am definitely not the forgiving victim. But the people, the homeless people that I work with who are suffering the most atrocious living conditions imaginable and who in return are judged that it's their fault, forgive us all the time. They forgive us all the time. The story of resurrection of an injured God, a wounded God, exists every day across this planet in the form of homelessness and many other things. Many other things. If we want to truly understand Jesus and cosmically understand Christ, we need to spend more time with wounded gods. And do you know who the wounded gods are right now in our lives besides the homeless, besides homeless people? I'll tell you. Drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes, drug dealers, pedophiles, murderers, thieves. They did not become these things in a vacuum. 
All of these things happened as part of the collective. And of course, the victims, the people that have been raped, the people, the families of, that, that, that have been that have, 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 have had their loved ones murdered or taken from them, their children taken from them uh, because of illness. People that have lost loved ones because of coronavirus. These are the people that we need to be with if we ever have any hope of understanding Jesus and much more big, I was going to say bigly, much more bigly, <laughs> much more bigly, Christ. Okay? You cannot understand Jesus and the Christ by showing up in a pew in a church. He's not there. He's not there. Jesus is not showing up on Sunday mornings in a fancy church. You're never going to see it. Now, there could be people in the church that represent the forgiving victim. They're in every community. You might find them there, but the church is not it. The church is just a place where the forgiving victims, the reincarnation of God sometimes go. That for me is Easter. Is finding the forgiving God who is a victim. Because they're everywhere. And when you find them, when you work with them, I tell you, without any doubt, you will feel God. You will feel it. You will feel God. I feel him all the time when I work with homeless people. And it doesn't have to be homeless people. It can be anybody that you gravitate towards. Could be old people dying in a alone in a in a um, you know adult senior community. It could be people with cancer. It can be kids with mortal illnesses. These are all the forgiving victims that are walking, talking. Jesus, they're the they are the Christ. We have to go to them to understand Easter. To understand the wounded God. Because they will blow you away. Those people will make your mind melt. Because they are the forgiving victim. All of them, they come to a place where they forgive all of our sins that have been thrown upon them. All right, that's what I wanted to tell you. That's the good news. That's what Easter means to me. I hope that you, uh, if you celebrate the Easter, have a nice Easter. Use Zoom meeting or something. My in-laws use Zoom meeting every every Saturday morning to get together with their friends. It's so charming and lovely. So lovely. And then they're recording them even. So, you know, do a video call with your family or something, okay? Or if you're out in the cold, um, you are loved and you are not forgotten and it is us that need to learn from you. You do not need to learn anything from us. 
All right, everybody, I love you. I wish you a happy Easter, and I will see you next time. Bye.